Hello, everyone. I hope you have been enjoying the Powering Pass Coal Alliance Global Summit so far. And I welcome you to our session on electricity grid transformation from coal to clean. It's co-hosted by the Pemina Institute and National Grid. I'm Binu Jackmar, Director of Clean Energy at the Pemina Institute here in Canada. And I will be your moderator for the first half of this session. Now, what brings us here today is a major concern that's shared by policymakers and almost everyone in the electricity sector when committing to or delivering a coal phase out. And that is, how do we make sure that the lights stay on? In this session, we want us, uh, yourselves to roll your sleeves up and look under the hood or bonnet uh, to see how we can maintain a reliable grid while transitioning away from coal and do it in an affordable manner. Now we know that there are many options readily available to replace coal and some of them are even cheaper. For example, by 2030, new wind and solar will be cheaper than existing coal fire generation. But these other options need to be scaled up and integrated into the grid in a manner that utilizes their unique features and also addresses their challenges. And this requires not only technical solutions, but also the right market signals. And in this session, we'll explore both those types of solutions. Uh, we have two panel discussions for you, an hour each. The first panel will do an overview of the challenges and best practices around reliability and cost. And the second panel, moderated by Johnny Gallagher from the National Grid, will dive deeper into the technological and regulatory considerations. Now, throughout this two-hour session, I encourage you to submit your questions and comments through the Slido chat box that is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we also have a few polling questions for you to get a sense of who's in the room and what issue areas are of most interest to you. So we really encourage you to participate through both those channels. Uh, for this starting panel, we'll have some introductory remarks from our panelists, and we'll follow that with a moderated Q&A based on the questions you're sending to us. Uh, we're actually very fortunate today to have panelists from jurisdictions in various stages of coal phase out, ranging from Ontario, which phased out coal way back in 2014, because, before it was even very cool, and to Chile that is phasing out coal by 2040. Uh, now to kick things off, I'd like to invite Julian Leslie, head of networks at the National Grid to the screen, uh, to share their experience as a grid operator in managing the transition. Julian, over to you. Great. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. So I'm Julian Leslie. I'm Head of Networks in the Electricity System Operator for National Grid here in Great Britain. Uh, I've just got a couple of slides in a few minutes just to talk through the sort of the progress that we've made in Britain and how we've got there. So we made a commitment um, that by 2025 that we as a system operator would have the tools available to us to fully operate the GB electricity system in a zero carbon emission way. So what that really means is when the market delivers that zero carbon solution that we won't be interfering with the market in order to bring on the grid services that we need to secure the system. We've come a long way in the last 10 years. Um, there's been obviously the policy and regulation which is very favourable to renewables. But it's also been favourable to us as the grid system operators in order to find routes to market and to facilitate a huge growth in renewable generation connections over the last 10 years. But a lot of our work is looking to the future and forecasting the various generation mixes that we foresee in the future and really understanding how these will impact the grid system operations and then finding innovative solutions and market solutions uh, that can solve those problems for us. This is a period of innovation and we believe that the markets are in a good place at defining the need and then sort of understanding what our requirements are as a system operator and letting the market to, to innovate and, uh, and transform their businesses in order to provide the services that we need. So the zero carbon by 2025, what does it mean? Well, in 2025, we'll probably have an hour or two hours on an August afternoon when it's sunny and it's windy, where we will be able to operate the system at zero carbon. From that basis, we will then see that those periods grow as we can not only phase out the coal generation, which is pretty much phased out uh, by 2025, but also start to phase out the, the system operator having to procure gas in the market in order to provide those grid services. There are some key challenges in doing this, uh, obviously frequency management, 
which is something we've always had to manage as a 50 gigawatt system on an island. The frequency management has always been a big part of our system operation uh, activities. But really the new things, inertia and voltage control that synchronous generation provide us, that obviously as they decline on the system, we need to replace with other opportunities and other technologies. I mean, the notable record was that on the 23rd of May last year, we almost had 100% renewable gener or zero carbon generation that was delivered to us by the market. But our interventions meant that actually the, the power we consumed on the day was only 85% zero carbon, which is a huge challenge. And one of the things that you never would have thought of a few years ago, could we get to 85% zero carbon? The answer would have been, well, it's really difficult. But actually we made it on the 23rd of May last year. So the actions that we're doing and the, in the key areas that we're doing now is just looking at that last 15%. And how do we find other products and services in the market that can allow us to, to, to run the system at 100% zero carbon? So there's some real technical areas we need to focus on. Stability, this is the inertia, this is the keeping the, a robust, stable system that we can operate from. Voltage is the power flows change rapidly across the system, ensuring we've got the right voltage profiles to ensure that the power is transferred uh, safely and, and efficiently. But also building a network that is um, predominantly based on wind and then managing this, the resulting constraints on the system to ensure that that wind can get to where it's needed to. And again, in, in as efficient and cost-effective way as possible. Frequency management is the thing that we're really focusing on though right now. And we launched a new product, which is dynamic containment which allows a response in a sub-second uh, basis. So we can really catch those frequency deviations very quickly and start to restore, restore the system frequency to our 50 Hertz that we work towards. And that has been a, it's a premium service. So we're paying a reasonable amount of money for it in the market, but it, the benefits it provides and in, in the rapid pace that we can now decarbonize, dynamic containment is really something we're really proud of and is really making a difference as to how we operate the grid system. But we're having to look at the whole system basis, so not just transmission, but also reaching into the distribution uh, generation also. And there's about 50,000 sites in the UK where we need verification on their loss of mains protection. And we have a big program of work that is going around each of those 50,000 sites to check the, the protection settings and change it if necessary. And again, that just gives us more flexibility as to how we can operate the system securely and safely as we, as we move towards this decarbonized future. But not forgetting, of course, that if the worst does come to the worst and we need to restore the system, how can we do that when we don't have the conventional power plants available to us that historically would have restarted the system? So we're looking at using wind combined with batteries at a transmission level, but also using um, a bottom-up build, so using the, the, the generation that's distributed across the distribution networks and restoring the network from the bottom up as well as from the top down. So I hope from this quick introduction, you can see there are lots of activities we're doing here in the UK. We've got four years to go before uh, we need to meet this ambition, uh, but we're on good track uh, to make progress towards that. And uh, hopefully I'll be here in four years time telling you about the first hour that we've run uh, with 100% zero carbon generation on the system. So with that, I'll hand back to, to Binyu. Thank you, Julian for that crash course on grid operation. Um, and also for starting our conversation off by setting the bar really high with your net zero operation target for 2025. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Heather Ferguson um, from Ontario Power Generation. She's the Senior VP of Corporate Affairs and uh, they also have a net zero commitment. So I think this is a good stage to pass it on to Heather. Lord yeah. Harrison. Thank you. And good morning. And thanks, Binu, for having me. Um, I thought before I, I kind of got into some of the, the, the lessons learned, I guess, or just a little bit of, of our, our, you know, where we've been in this process of getting off coal, just a little bit about Ontario Power Generation or, or OPG is how I'll kind of refer to it. So we're the largest clean power generator in the province of Ontario. We produce about half of the province's power and we're owned by the provincial government. Um, 
but we are among one of the most diverse uh, generating companies in North America, I think we can say, is we've got a portfolio that exists of, of, of nuclear and, and water power, that's kind of our primary base load, but we also have solar assets, um, biomass facilities, and, and some gas in our system as well. So a really, a really diverse portfolio, which I actually think is, is pretty critical as you approach some of the issues and, and transitioning off coal and transitioning to net zero. I think this diversity is, is really gonna be quite helpful um, for the Ontario jurisdiction, but probably for many others as well. Um, and we also actually own a US subsidiary called Eagle Creek Renewable Energy. So about 600 megawatts of, of small hydro stations sort of scattered throughout the US, kind of centered in the Northeast a fair bit. So, I mean, I think yesterday in the in the opening up session with uh, with the ministers, I spoke about and Binu mentioned, you know, one of one of the most proudest achievements, I guess, of OPG over the past decade or so was was closure of our coal assets. So that that took nine thousand megawatts of coal out of the system, and you know, it wasn't an overnight process. It was pretty much a decade long process, kind of starting in twenty. 2004 and culminating in 2014. Um, and, and as I said yesterday, and we repeat often that this remains, you know, one of the world's single largest climate change specific actions. Um, it made a dramatic difference in the electricity sector in Ontario, where, um, you know, carbon output from the sector went from nearly 20% of emissions down to 2%. So, um, you know, in coal at the time, at the initial point when we thought about taking coal off the system, it was about 25% of Ontario's generation. So it was a huge part of the province's electricity footprint and OPG's footprint. Um, so, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of hard work um, done there. But, uh, you know, I thought uh, I'd talk a little bit about some of the challenges just quite briefly in this, this opening piece, because I think it could be, um, could be beneficial to, to some people. So at the time when we, we looked to transition off coal and kind of round the bend on it was, was the same time where um, demand was going down in the province. So it was around the time of the economic downturn, 2008, 2009, and there was a huge drop in industrial load, a big drop off in electricity demand. Um, and at the same time, you know, as you would want to bring about sort of a, a cleaner system, um, a considerable number of clean electricity fixed price long-term contracts were brought onto the grid. Um, so it was a bit of a perfect storm where, you know, unfortunately what we did was we built up um, sort of an overabundance of a clean electricity supply at a time when load was dropping off. So um, again, a bit of a perfect storm, not to say that those same um, economic conditions are going to be realities for many other jurisdictions, but it was just a, an interesting, and it was a point in time too where some of these technologies were not um, down the cost curve far enough. I mean, I think we see now how incredibly affordable uh, wind and solar and other, you know, other technologies can be. That wasn't the case back in sort of the 2005, six, seven, eight timeframe. So what, what, what really resulted was a significant increase in, in customer costs in, in Ontario. Ontario and and that remains today something that we continue to to think about and to think about how we can work with the province to to mitigate that and um, it's always in our minds as we go about um, our business and as we go about continuing to reach a net zero goal and I think many other jurisdictions have that in their minds so it was, it was a hard hard price to pay, but the, the, the benefit now being that we have an incredibly clean electricity grid, uh, a very resilient, diverse electricity grid. Um, and so now we're in a position, as I think everyone realizes, what needs to be done to, to reach net zero is not just to clean up the electricity system, but to take that clean electricity and power other, other sectors and decarbonize other sectors like transportation. Um, that's that's the most obvious one, but also, you know, buildings and heating systems and industrial processes need to be part of that. Um, and so, you know, at this point, what we're doing is we've set ambitious goals. I think Binu made a reference. We have a, a climate change plan with a very ambitious goal to be net zero as a company by 2040. Um, and our plan is going to need to leverage further diverse technologies. Um, we're looking at small modular reactors. We're we're looking to hydrogen and thinking about what hydrogen could do for the transportation sector, but also what could that mean um, for the for the gas assets that we own. We have a small portfolio of gas assets within Ontario as well. So. Um, Really, I guess my message would be is that it's about embracing all available technologies um, to reach these goals and to, to get to net zero. So um, that, that would be our, our key overriding message. So thank you.
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Heather. And thank you for sharing yeah, some of those real world challenges as you particularly take your first steps. You can't predict uh, what the economy is going to be like, what the load profile might change like as you are taking some of these big steps. So um, yeah, really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, now, moving um, towards Europe, uh, I'll bring in uh, Rodolfo Martinez Campillo who's the head of infrastructure regulation at Iberdrola uh, to share the story of the Spanish coal phase out and what Iberdrola is doing as a company. Rodolfo, over to you. Thank you, Benio. Yes, uh, we have a similar story of getting out of coal. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, traditionally coal meant about 50 terawatt hours of electricity per year. It was about a third of the production was coal both domestic coal and also imported coal. And in the, from 2000 to 2010, we went through a very fast uh, development of renewables. And we reached 23 gigawatts of wind and five gigawatts of solar uh, around 2010. But we have the crisis of the 2008 and 2012, which is probably the, the period where the crisis really struck. And that development got stalled. Uh, we couldn't sustain such a um, effort in, in new renewables. And, and therefore, we had no, no new renewables up until last year, 2019, 2020. Um, the surprising thing about this uh, introduction of renewables in Spain was that those renewables did not displace coal. They displaced gas, which is much cleaner. And that was probably a, a, an error in the, in the market, a not well-defined market. And in some instances, uh, some issues that happened uh, regarding the supply chain of coal and the uh, effects on, on, on jobs and, and, and the like. So uh, in that way, we introduced renewables, but we did not reduce the coal, which was not a good thing to do. But luckily, uh, things began to change uh, in 2019. You all know that the price of emissions in Europe uh, increased a lot. And this displacement from gas to coal happened naturally based on the price of, 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 of carbon. Price of carbon that is, is added to the, to the offers to, into the market. Therefore, uh, gas is cheaper than, than coal. And therefore, we were able to reduce uh, coal production. Uh, up to uh, last year in 2020, it was only 2% of generation was based on coal. The rest were renewables, uh, nuclear, and gas. Uh, in 2020, 45% of the generation was renewable, and 70% was carbon free, thanks to nuclear and, and other resources like, like, um, like uh, bioenergies. So in that regard, uh, we are continuing to invest uh, in a new phase of the investment in renewables. Uh, uh, solar is growing, wind is growing. We are also thinking about uh, offshore. In the case of Spain, we cannot install uh, offshore uh, that is connected to the seabed, but we, it has to be or will be, sorry, we will be uh, based on floating offshore. and. Uh, as a, as a piece of data, uh, this February 2021, 64% of the demand was covered with renewables. Uh, so that was, uh, uh, we are very fast on track with no mm, major effects in terms of reliability or stability of the system. Uh, today, renewables participate in the ancillary services markets. They can reduce the, the production when there is an excess uh, supply of renewables, so demand um, and, and generation can be uh, controlled. The system operator controls that uh, in real time. So the system is as stable as, as, as ever. No, no, big, uh, no big problems there. But let me also talk about the fact that decarbonization is not only about reducing the emissions at the generation level. We need also to participate in the distribution and customer side. In, in terms of distribution grids, uh, we need to invest a lot in, in to, to be able to include all the new demand that are needed for the energy transition. We need to uh, electrify heat. We need to electrify mobility. We need more grids to be able to provide these new loads, which, uh, which are 
basically main, uh, they are laws that need a lot of power, maybe not so much energy, but a lot of power. We need to provide that power to our customers. These laws are going to be flexible, so we, we will have, or we will enjoy this flexibility from the demand side connection of, of these new loads. And uh, we need to take into account the importance of resiliency. That's a very important issue because, as you know, climate change is going to mean it's always uh, uh, it's apparent to, to everyone already that we are going to have weather events and the electricity system is critical. We need to have a reliable electricity system and it has to be built from bottom up with a very reliable distribution grid. And just let me uh, finalize with a word about human components. And this is important. Human component is also important for the energy transition. We need to have engaged customers. We need to have customers that understand the need and the new implications of clean energy. We need to, uh, for new customers to provide flexibility to the system. And finally, we need to develop skills in the electricity industry to really be able to manage all this with proficiency and with quality of supply. Thank you, Denise. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your remarks, Rodolfo. I think you're connecting to various different uh, themes and larger parts of the system as well. I just want to remind folks here, Rodolfo, to your last point around this is also about people. Uh, we do have a session coming up on just transition, so I encourage the audience um, to also tune in to that uh, coming up later. Um, and I want to pick up on a few things also, Rodolfo. You uh, tied the impact uh, of carbon pricing on the electricity market, and hopefully we can dive a bit deeper into that too. Thank you for bringing that up. And as well as the demand side of the equation, I think we often tend to look at just the supply side uh, going into this. So thanks for bringing that into the conversation. Um, I'll pass it now to Claudio Zebach, uh, the executive chairman of Generadoras de Chile, uh, to give an overview of their grid transition efforts Claudio, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Binu. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to share a, the Chilean experience on our own electricity grid transition from coal to clean. Just a brief introduction, I, I chair Generadoras de Chile. Uh, it's a business association of companies that operate in our market. It's a collection of 15 very diverse companies from different countries, technologies, portfolios, and our grid, just to understand a little bit how um, the coal phase out works in our grid, is and it's very peculiar. You might know the shape of our country. It's a long country, more than 4,000 kilometers long, and the grid is 3,100 kilometers, pretty linear grid from the border in Peru to southern Chile at the beginning of Patagonia. Uh, it's 25 gigawatts, roughly, of installed capacity with no operating interconnection with Latin America, so we're standalone. In the last decades, to keep up with the fast economic growth of Chile, we had to move away from a mainly renewable hydropower-based power generation mix until reaching around 40% of electricity produced from the burning of coal in the recent years. That's, that's among the highest within the OECD, which we are part of. The good news is that, as uh, we'll speak about that later, is that we're moving away very fast from coal. In early 2018, that's briefly after the COP23 and the launching of, of the Powering Past Coal Alliance initial declaration, an agreement was reached between the Chilean government, us, General de Chile, and the companies that run coal-fired plants in Chile, that is AES from the US, NG and NL from Europe, and Colbun, which is a Chilean company, with a commitment from new, new coal-based developments and to start a process to fully phase out coal. A structured roundtable process that took roughly a year to, uh, was started uh, with several actors from the companies, from ministries of energy environment, the National Energy Commission, the operator, a trade association, consumer associations like the Mining Council, which is a big consumer, local authorities, labor unions, academia was, were brought together to discuss the technical, economic, environmental and social aspects which are part of a, a broader decommissioning of coal-fired plants in an electric system. Following that, government uh, negotiated bilaterally because of antitrust considerations with, um, with the companies for the precise timeline for taking power plants offline, uh, an initial timeline for the first five years, and a plan called the Zero Coal Energy Plan was launched a year, two years ago, a year and a half ago. 
with an initial timeline to disconnect around a third within the first five years. So 1.7 gigawatts uh, disconnection and a full phase out 2040 at the latest. Um, this process, of course, adaptive. So it takes account of market design changes and technical improvements, social considerations. And after the first five years to plan ahead for the next phase out. Um, some companies even started anticipating the disconnection of units before the initial plan date. And they've added new units, they're not included. A, as another mention will, that has indirectly to do with this is a carbon tax had been introduced earlier in 2015. And very recently, a mothballing, mothballing reserve payment was introduced in the regulation, which also allows companies to a, advance the retirement. A, and it's a five-year at the maximum mothballing reserve payment. And there have been some novel financial mechanisms for the early core retirements and to finance renewables. Tomorrow, Fernando Cubillos, it's also a Chilean that works at IDB Invest, will speak about that on another session. So, so the coal phase out process had other challenges, which is especially to address the just transition with workers, unions, and communities. We don't produce coal, we only use coal, but still, um, each company had worked on these plans with their stakeholders, and government has been drafting a just transition strategy, which is part of Chilean NDC commitment for the coal phase out. Um, but that will include coal and also the whole decarbonization of the economy in, at the end for a just transition. Just, well, in that sense, you've probably read about it. Uh, Chile, in, in a way, has become a star in the massive arrival of new renewables like wind and solar. Like, it's really impressive. 90, 90% of new developments is, are, are renewable. And we've also committed to carbon neutrality by 2050, which with broad political support, very broad, We've been a highly attractive market for renewables, according to Bloomberg, New Energy Finance, or the EY Rikai indexes. We've been ranking always within one, two, three, top ranking. And the underlying principles for that has been just not the fact of the renewables only, but the openness of our economy to foreign investment, free trade, uh, very low import tariffs, so you can import technology very cheaply, intense competition in our generation market and sound public policy with a long-term commitment with sustainable growth. There have been long-term auctions which help to fund uh, new investments. Interestingly enough, there are no public subsidies to renewables, apart, of course, from endowment of massive sunshine in Atacama, winds from the Pacific, or water running from the Andes, or the heat of our volcanoes, but, but that's it. So just go phase out. Plus, these new renewables will, of course, require a large upgrade of transmission, increased with great, great flexibility and storage. Now, we hope to move from the current 45% um, we are now in to 85% share of renewables by 2030. And what we've seen is that the power sector will contribute with 60% of the greenhouse gas emission reductions in the NDC of Chile. So it's the first sector that is, so to say, pushing the uh, emission reduction of Chile. Well, we all know that the climate urgency gives us really little time. So, so the scope and need, speed we need for the energy transformation is just so big that we think that the path of a private sector market approach for the energy transition to carbon neutrality um, through, and as Rodolfo mentioned, electrification and a renewable electricity in the context of having sound public policy we hope, and that's, of course, happy to share here further, is that can be an example for, for many other countries, particularly developing economies, to follow uh, and make coal part of history. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, could pick up on so many questions just from what you said just now. Um, I think it was especially interesting yeah, hearing what, how you engaged all these different actors right at the beginning. These are some of the first steps uh, a lot of jurisdictions need to do when they're first trying to figure out how to phase out coal. Uh, you mentioned a lot of things around public policy and the nature of the market. I do want to pick up on that, Claudia, later as we um, go into the discussion questions. Um, so I want to kick off the Q&A with a few 
prepared questions, but I do want to start incorporating uh, questions that come in through Slido. So I encourage, again, participants to enter their questions into the chat box, and we'll see them pop up here and incorporate them as we uh, go along. Uh, for the panelists, I request you to try and keep your responses to about a minute if you can. Um, and yeah, let's kick it off. So the first thing I want to start with is the elephant in the room. I know this is what people think of when they saw the session on reliability was the story of Texas. Um, you know, speaking of people, I think it's a remarkable story of also what grid operators, technicians are doing on the ground to bring a grid back up. Um, but one of the other thing, side effects of uh, an event like this is it also perpetuates the myths around the reliability of renewables. Now we do know that renewables are variable and they operate differently than conventional thermal generation. So that comes with some benefits as well as challenges. Um, but putting those myths aside, one of the things that's coming out of this analysis of Texas is that we really need to look at grid planning um, carefully. So I wanted to pick up on that one thread and ask the panelists, uh, what shifts do you think that need to happen around generation planning and grid planning uh, as we incorporate more and more variable generation? So Julian, you kind of alluded to this a little bit in your presentation. So if I can ask you to start the comments on this one. Sure. So, I mean, grid planning is absolutely crucial, understanding your sort of future uh, energy mix and where it's going to come from and the types of technologies, and then trying to ascertain, well, what does that mean from a grid operator perspective? So, we're very much uh, renewable-led, and we will allow the renewables to connect, and then we'll find other solutions to, to make up for the grid services. So, we're procuring uh, sync comps and flywheels and, and a whole host of technologies that provide us with inertia on the system. I think though that, I mean, what we have here in GB is we have a capacity mechanism. So we, we know that there is controllable generation that, that is available and can make up any sort of shortfall that renewables make on any one particular day through the winter, especially. So there are mechanisms in place that ensure that as well as the renewables, there is enough um, megawatts available to supply that sort of peak national demand if we get one of those weather conditions where there is very little renewable but obviously we still need to meet the national demand. But in terms of looking to the future though, what is the role of long duration storage and seasonal storage and all those other questions? That's the sort of thing where I'm focusing my attention on now is on how do we move away from having to have this fossil fuel as a backup source and actually how can we capture the excess renewables when it is really windy and store that for the days and the time when it isn't. Uh, thanks. Uh, Rodolfo, uh, do you want to come in as well with Iberdrola's experience in this? Yeah, so I, I can say that uh, we are lucky to have the UK and Ireland to be the first to suffer the possible consequences of having a system with a lot of renewables. Mm -hmm. We have been analyzing your new uh, ancillary services markets. Uh, Ireland is doing also a great job in, in systematizing having systemic approach to new uh, markets to have uh, the optimal solution to all this. And from the continental Europe side of the problem, we, we enjoy the, the fact that we are interconnected. So we have more, more, uh, more capability of uh, withstanding any kind of problems, but we, our experience with wind uh, over the last 15 years is that at the beginning, some of the protection equipment were not perfectly tuned. Some of the um, operational situation were not all, also very well uh, tuned, but we learn from, from those issues. And, and now uh, renewables are very, very um, reliable. And our system operator can switch off when, it's, uh, when there is too much wind, they can switch off very quickly and very safely uh, renewables. So renewables are not a problem in the, in the area of uh, system stability. Uh, it's going to be more real time, but we have the digitalization. We have uh, better uh, control systems. And this is absolutely critical. Uh, and therefore, the feeling from the user side is that today's electricity is much more reliable than, than years ago, because yes, we have more renewables, but we have more digitalization, more capability in the system operator, more professionals dedicated to this. 
And, and we have been through uh, this January through a very nasty storm with a lot of uh, snow and all that. And the, the, the system worked uh, pretty fine. So no problem from that. Uh, great. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Rodolfo and Julian. And yeah, Rodolfo, especially to sort of also look at the other side of the narrative where, yeah, rely, uh, the new developments that have happened in the system can actually increase reliability um, rather than just being a liability in terms of reliability. Um, one other issue that I know is on top of mind for our listeners, and I see a few questions coming in around that, is uh, the idea of cost to consumers. And Heather, you had also spoken a bit about that with OPG's uh, experience. And I wanted to dive into that a bit with two perspectives. One is how do you create value for customers so that they actually benefit in their energy bills uh, through this grid transition? And then the other from the cost mitigation perspective is how do you protect the consumers of today? But I know you're also responsible for consumers of tomorrow. So like, how do you manage uh, balancing both those uh, consumers of today as well as those from a couple of decades from now. Um, so maybe I'll get Heather, you to start the comments. Sure. I mean, I, I think, you know, maybe you need to take a slightly higher level perspective at that rather than thinking, you know, of course, this all translate down, translates down to, you know, consumers bills that we all receive from our electricity distributors. But I think if we think about the situation we're in right now, um, so one where we're in a, uh, you know, a hopefully coming out of a post-COVID world or we're thinking about economic recovery and, and we're also thinking about broader global goals around decarbonization and net zero. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity to sort of to link those two and think about how energy and electricity can be an economic engine to get us out of these situations. And then to link some of the short term goals that um, many governments and policymakers have around jobs and economic recovery with the longer term goals. And so what that entire sort of um, situation presents is a huge opportunity for there to be government policy signals that will spur private investment, that will spur um, efficient competition in these spaces, economies of scale as we think about cost efficiency. So somewhat counter to, you know, the situation in Ontario, what we faced where, you know, some, some relatively expensive long-term fixed price contracts were signed on early days in, in a technology deployment around wind and solar, which, which which did lead to you know, consumer impacts, customer impacts. I think now we're in a different situation, granted where you know, economic recovery is, is a huge piece of that, but I think there's so much that can be done with these government policy signals and a significant amount of private investment that I think we're going to see. I don't think there's any private investment fund that's not thinking about ways to invest in clean technologies, clean tech, solutions that mitigate climate change. And with that, you will get um, you know, the efficiency, the competition and the economies of scales and the protection of consumers that I think you will need. Um, thank you so much, Heather. Yeah, there's so many of these market mechanisms we can adopt. I was also thinking of it maybe from technical investment perspective. And Julian, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. So I know National Grid has been trying some innovative ways of avoiding uh, overinvestment in transmission infrastructure in the short term. So if you can speak a bit to that. Sure. I mean, we were very fortunate here in GB that in, in 2010, we, the government created some uh, legislation that allowed us to do what we call connect and manage. So you can connect to the generation and then manage the outcome at the output of that. And that's allowed us to move to sort of probabilistic cost benefit assessment on network, in, on network investment. Uh, whereas prior to 2010, you had to wait for the network to be fully invested before you could connect the generation. So through this connect and manage, through the cost benefit assessment for network investment, we've been able to really look at sort of the future scenarios, look at the least worst regret cost benefit. Uh, and through that, yes, we're signaling a lot of investment, but we're also um, saving the consumer sort of, we, we predict sort of two to three billion pounds per year in terms of avoided investment, but also optimum management of congestion across the network. So it's been a huge step forward, but as I say it was all released by this sort of policy decision back in 2010 that allowed us to move to this connect and manage regime. And that has opened up, we didn't know at the time, but it's opened up this huge potential to really look at this least worst regret cost benefit assessment uh, for making network investments. Great. 
That was excellent illustration, Julian. Thank you. Um, we've got some questions coming in now on financing mechanisms, looking at both financing mechanisms that can enable an early coal phase out, uh, as well as uh, enable investments in renewables. So just want to point out, we do have a session coming up that Claudio referred to tomorrow that's going to be talking about financial mechanisms for an accelerated coal phase out. But I want to flip that question a bit because it's not just financial mechanisms, but there might be market signals that we can send that can enable investments in renewables. And I know there are a lot of countries that are looking at how can we attract renewable investments rather than coal and particularly investments in some of these other technologies. Um, uh, both Rodolfo and Claudia, you sort of uh, referred to that. So maybe I'll start with Rodolfo, if you can speak to that. Well, probably I would say that uh, uh, 10 years ago, you needed to have some kind of uh, feeding tariff or some kind of subsidy support for renewables. And therefore, you could control the amount of renewables that would enter into the system. Uh, but today, most of the investors are just willing to get into the markets with no, no need for, for support. I would say that today in Spain, we have a, a mixed system. There are some, recently we had some auctions for, for new renewables in which they bid for the, for the price, for the long-term price. But there is plenty of other renewables that are just merchant or PPAs. PPAs is a great thing. Uh, if you sign a contract with a big customer, they are willing to purchase uh, renewable energy for a long period of time. So probably what, what I would envision is the fact that we will have a mixture of different uh, types of financing. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for only one as a mandate. Uh, I think we can let the market operate and, and allow investors to, to, to be free to decide what, uh, how to invest in renewables. Great. Thank you, Rodolfo. I'll pass it to you, Claudio. Thank you, Vino. Well, um, market design, as someone said, is, is key. It's like the software on, on, on running on the hardware of the technology, which um, again, as I mentioned in the case of Chile, uh, we've never uh, had specific, uh, well, there are some specific laws for, for renewables, but we've never had feed and tariffs or or, or or specific like funding, public funding to to foster renewables. So it has been market driven, and of course we've benefited from the impressive uh, co cost uh, changes. And that's that's of course because some other countries led that uh, the the reduction of cost and technology diversification. But again, um, what we are working at is is a market design for flexibility. So what what should be the the signals for to both foster investment and operations uh, of, of more flexible assets. And then you have to address the cost question. So, so we've, we've shown that increased share of renewables brings the whole cost down, but of course the cost of flexibility goes up. And, and then on where, and how do you uh, put on who pays for that flexibility it has been of course a leading question on the market design. But the, the good news is, is that if you do it well, the final output is lower cost. But, but you have to really uh, make sure that the transition into that is, is done well. And then um, demand has a role. Uh, we have two big markets. One is the regulated customers. We have long-term auctions for, for um, regulated customers. And then the whole PPA market of, of particularly mining. Mining is like 30% of, of our con 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 electricity consumption. Mining has been pushing strongly in the recent years to decarbonize the production of we're, we're the first largest producer in copper in the world so we like to have green copper so so if they've been have an active role in telling the electricity companies we would like to have renewable electricity so that's a big part and the regulated customers of course it's price the, but but if you've given away long-term auctions like 20-year auctions you end up having the, the future prediction that costs will still go down and that has been basically all new um, winners of auctions, which is our, our technology neutral, have been for the regulated market uh, won by renewable uh, 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 technologies. But at the end, um, again, going to market design and not specifically defining priority technology is because diversity is key. So we have diversity and now we're very, in very few weeks we'll have the first CSP plant running, starting up in, in Latin America, in Chile. Then we have a lot of still of hydropower. 
and then we have some biomass, so we jump some little geothermal. So, so diversity is key. And the final question for market design is quality and predictability of regulation. If you want to have the same investor that were running the, the past technologies, you want them still investing in the new technologies and phasing out. So it's not like kicking out the ones that own coal and bringing in new ones. The biggest investor in new renewables are the ones that were running coal in the past. So make sure that you, you sort of, if you change regulations, you don't end up messing up with the fact that you will have, you want the same people changing the market from in, within. Right. Um, thanks, Claudio. Yeah, I think that that is a concern for many jurisdictions, also keeping the main players in the game uh, while attracting new investments. Um, I just also wanted to pick up on one thread uh, that I think both you and Rodolfo mentioned was it doesn't necessarily always have to be the government. You can also have corporate power purchase agreements. So like you said, in your science and for the mining sector, as well as other sectors. So, you know, there are things we could do to encourage corporate PPAs as well. Uh, but as you were talking there, Claudia, I think people are very curious about Chile. Um, there's a lot of questions coming up on generation mix. I actually want to open this up uh, to first Claudia, but then other folks as well, um, is what does the generation mix need to look like? Um, there are challenges in some jurisdictions where they may not have uh, the type of solar energy that you have in Chile. Uh, so looking at what are some options for them. But the specific question for Chile also, Claudio, is around uh, since you don't have grid storage technologies deployed yet at the scale they need to be, and with the geography that you mentioned, uh, how are you dealing with uh, the high level of solar that's coming in? So we'll start with that, and then for Generation Mix, open it up. Well, one thing I didn't mention because was another question, but about the planning, of course, it's not the amount of new power generation cap uh, amount of generation we are we're lacking. We're, we're the, big, the biggest two constraints for both a faster uh, retirement of coal, but in general, a decarbonization is, is transmission. And the fact that we have, let's say, five poles of areas where we have concentrated coal on the coast, uh, it's cooled by the ocean, and those places now we will be retiring coal. So now the whole renewable comes from other places in the country. So the, the constraint is, is, is transmission because there's plenty of sun. We have hundreds of times more sun than we need as, 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 as generation capacity. So in fact, it's interesting because we, Chile was a leader, like uh, some of we've had uh, storage already working like for the last 10 years or more connected to coal plants. But now grid storage is coming more as a player um, in, into, the, into the system. It, it's now already starting to have hybrid plants with PV and also with hydropower, runoff river hydropower. But it's not, of course, the scale and speed. But the question is, and at with, we see it, is not only renewable electricity. The final aim is, of course, uh, carbon neutrality of the economy. So is, is the most cost efficient way to achieve carbon neutrality is, is a combination of a trajectory of reducing the carbon intensity of the electricity, but at the same time, the electrification or production of, let's say, green hydrogen for replacing mining trucks, a uh, diesel. So it's not just blunt 100% uh, renewables that might be of a, the, a not efficient if you put in a big picture of, of carbon neutrality, which is the actual goal we, we have. So, so the, so that's, that's kind of what we see it has to be been brought in both at the same time. And of course it's a final customer uh, or the cost for the economy. Still the, the question is electricity needs to be a driver for competitiveness of the economy productivity. We don't need to forget that. So, so bringing all these th aspects together is our studies show that the whole carbon neutrality is good business. So it brings new, better economy, cheaper costs, but it's not, but the, what, what steps you do and what is the most in, uh, efficient way of reducing carbon, uh, carbon emissions is not only the introduction of renewable phasing out of coal, but a whole set of market uh, production of, of carbon in, in emissions. As I said, we're starting, let's say we have 800 electric buses in the city of Santiago. That might be more cost efficient than an immediate reduction, or it's technically unfeasible to disconnect a power plant because there are no transmission lines. 
Yeah, thank you for that, Claudia. And I feel like you almost corrected my question that I appreciated, like that we don't need to just be looking at this when we're looking at, yeah, what do we do with variable generation? It's not just looking at the generation mix, but like all parts of the system. It's the transmission solutions as well as uh, the end uses of electric, uh, electricity and how, how do we manage all of that. So thanks for broadening that up. Uh, maybe sort of following on that theme, um, I think a few of you had mentioned uh, the need for flexibility in the system as new types of uh, customers come online, new types of load is coming into the system and obviously with increased variable generation. So maybe sort of keeping that frame in mind, if you can speak to a bit, you know, what is this, um, what are the new types of technologies we need to integrate into the grid to be able to deliver on grid flexibility? Um, what are the different features and operating characteristics that these technologies need to have across those three buckets of generation transmission and um, the distribution or end use? And um, maybe Heather, you had mentioned about the need for diversity. So maybe I'll start with you and then we can kick it off to other panelists. And I, I'm just going to back up a little bit because I, I liked your previous question about, you know, you know it, it builds off around the diversity. So I think what we're going to see um, you know, as we get through the coal transition and many jurisdictions get to, to maybe where Ontario has gotten and many are ahead, um, electrification is, is just going to be essential for decarbonization. And whether you're talking about transportation, industrial processes, resource extraction, you name it. And what I think we're going to see, uh, and maybe I'm an optimist because I work for an electricity generation company, but I think we're going to see a much, much more aggressive, um, you know, uptick in demand. And I think that whether, you know, the question isn't if that's going to happen, it's when. And, and so I think as we look at more aggressive electrification scenarios, which I think are entirely possible, even if we look at transportation and what's happening with the various OEMs and their production of, of electric vehicles in, in all different shapes and forms across the entire spectrum. And, and these are coming, you know, not in, in decades, but in, in near term projections. So we're going to see, I believe, a much more aggressive electrification, even just looking at transportation. And so when we look at how are we going to meet that demand and how are we going to meet it from a generation, but also, I mean, you know, very appropriately transmission and distribution. On the generation side, I think it's just going to be about leveraging all available technology. So I, I spoke about, you know, OPG's portfolio being a, a relatively, well, quite a diverse portfolio of water power, nuclear, a bit of gas, renewables, um, the whole spectrum there. I think that that's what's going to lend itself to the system resiliency that we need so that we don't end up in some situations that we've seen in jur other jurisdictions and whether those are due to, you know, severe weather events and climate change. Um, you know, we need to build in that system resiliency and also, you know, the economies that are, are needed around that. And I think also approaching this in a way that's respectful of the, the reality of the geography in which you operate. So certain jurisdictions are going to lend themselves tremendously to, to wind power and to solar. Others are not. And so you need to have a system to maintain that resiliency and system reliability that is respectful of that. So, um, and, and with that, you will get cost efficiencies um, coming out of it. If you're trying to build up, a, say, a purely renewable wind and solar system in a, I'll say, a northern jurisdiction, perhaps like Ontario, you're going to have to overbuild the system to such an extent and put in such a volume of battery storage that that won't lead to cost efficiency. That'll be an expensive and overbuilt system. So thinking about what kind of diversity you can have in your generation system, I think will lead to, uh, to that resiliency. But that's just from a generator's perspective, but I'd be interested to hear um, from the other folks on the panel. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know, Julian, do you want to come in here and then maybe Rodolfo? Yeah, sure. And I think I mean, it's an interesting sort of area to look at. And I think as you look to the future, the role of demand in, in balancing the system uh, and whether when you get a high renewable system like the one we're going to have in GB, whether actually the, it's the demand that is controllable because you can control when you're charging the electric vehicles, you can control when you're charging the battery in people's roofs and loft space, and you can control when you're charging sort of the grid scale storage also. Whereas the wind and the solar, you can't control. It's either there one day or it's not. And therefore, I think very soon, um, and we're already seeing in the UK, there are some domestic tariffs which will pay consumers to move and shift their demand. So actually we pay, this particular supplier in the UK pays its customers to charge the vehicles on a windy Sunday afternoon when the demand is low. 
So we're already beginning to see this shift. So actually, this the demand which is becoming really flexible. The generation, renewable generation, is really flexible. But obviously, if it's not windy, it's not sunny, it's not there. So shifting your demand to meet those renewable peaks, I think, will be how we need to think about the system as we move forward. Great. Thank you, Julian. Um, Rodolfo, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Complementing what uh, Julian just said, uh, True, the renewables are flexible. They can be powered down easily. But I would like to mention a couple of things that I think uh, are very important in the future in terms of flexibility. Uh, demand can provide flexibility, that's for sure. But I would not put too much um, hopes in the, in the fact that demand can do the whole job. That is mm -hmm. not possible. We need to make sure that, that customers don't think that we are curtailing them or we are just rationing the electricity. They need to be able to consume electricity whenever they want, as much as they need. That's important, whatever the weather conditions. And flexibility will come from the Internet of Things. Uh, uh, appliances, new demands, uh, electric vehicles, all will be connected to the Internet. They will be able to provide their flexibility up to a point where the customer doesn't suffer any, any impact, and they all added together will be a relevant, important part of, of the flexibility. But let's make sure that, the, that we don't put extreme prices to the customers so that they have to uh, you know, give up using electricity. That is another way to go. And the other side that I would like to mention is generation. Okay, so far we have still uh, enough gas consumption in our combined cycles to provide uh, good backup. But we need to be able to manage and to think what happens when we only have two, three weeks of needed backup from the generation side. Is the gas system, the whole gas system going to be sustainable? How much we need to pay? How can we plan and how much we need to or dimension this uh, backup system to be able to be affordable for the whole system. So that's a, a, a question that is important to be solved because uh, storage, with the storage, we have a huge problem. We can have short-term storage with batteries. It works absolutely fine. We, we have experience with that. It's absolutely a, a wonderful technology, but we do not have seasonal storage other than maybe hydro, but hydro is only available when it's, when it's available. So that's, that's not a, a question. So, not having, and um, maybe not in the foreseeable future, not having long-term storage that can compensate for a 100% free or 100% renewable system, we need to consider to have that little bit of two weeks a year backup from gas that has to be sustainable. And I'm talking about capacity payments, and I'm talking about the dimensioning and the sustainability of this system. Um. Awesome, thank you, uh, folks. I think it's about time to, for us to start wrapping this panel up. I do want to acknowledge there are some questions that are coming in that are a bit more technical in nature, asking about flywheels and inertia. And I want to assure you the our following session is going to go a bit dive deeper into the technical aspects and more the regulatory design aspects too. So maybe I'll let um, Johnny answer some of those questions. Uh, but to wrap up, this panel, I wanted to end with a final question for our panelists. Um, uh, what is one thing you thought that was impossible 10 years ago and uh, now you think is feasible? Maybe I'll start with uh, Julian, uh, then Heather, Rodolfo, Claudio. So I think the, the thing that's really changed for us is the, is the assumption around base load. 10 years ago, we talked about having coal and nuclear as a base load. We don't talk about that anymore. It's, it's whatever the market provides. And if it's wind and solar, that's our base load. And then we look at what we need to top it up to ensure we have a safe and reliable grid. So it's just fundamentally turned on its head the way we think about how we operate the grid system, which you just couldn't have conceived 10 years ago. Thanks, Julian. Heather? I'm going to stay away from sort of the, the electricity market in particular and the technical aspects of it about what I thought was impossible and, and pick up on something that Mark Carney said yesterday, which I thought was um, really, you know, I mean, refreshing maybe isn't the right word, but really uh, clear of where we are in these these times. And he said, you know, it used to be that sort of net zero and climate change ambitions and goals 
you know, they used to be a CSR issue. So, you know, one of, of, of you know, corporate social responsibility and that was the lens in which these things were contemplated. And, and now really it's, a, as he put it, a strategic C-suite issue. So, so really articulating, I think, the importance of, of these net zero goals of getting off coal, of meeting um, climate change, uh, you know, ambitions. And, you know, I think looking at it both from a, a risk and an opportunity perspective. So I would say 10 years ago, never would I have imagined that, um, you know, things like climate change plans would be foundational to a business's uh, business plan and strategic growth plan the way they are at OPG now. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's just telling of how incredibly critical and important these conversations are. So I think it's, I think it's a good story because I think it's going to ensure we get to where we need to be because that's really the, the, the level these conversations need to be had at. Great. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Rodolfo. Yeah, I, I would go to, uh, for the technical side of it. Uh, Ten years ago, we thought that it was not possible to run a system, a big system, even a continental system, uh, other than with uh, synchronous uh, generation, big generation. I believe that today we can have a system as, as large as we need uh, with uh, inverter-based generation and asynchronous generation. It's going to be stable. It's going to be reliable. So that's great news. It's digitalization and it's uh, electronics. Myself, I am an electronical engineer, and I love the fact that electronics can really be a good answer to the solution. Thanks, Rodolfo. Uh, Claudio. Well, it's, it's a great question, but I, I'd say 10 years ago, I never managed, imagined that humanity can stop burning things at some point in time. And that means we can address both local impacts, and Chile is still burning of firewood as the biggest local pollution impact we have in central southern Chile, and global impacts of, of, of CO2 emissions. And, and that, so to say, I think, I don't know, it's probably the first time, and, and that's a good point, that it used to be more of a CSR uh, look, but it's in the, in the end, I think it's for the first time, at least in the energy sector, we, we were able to align economic, social, and environmental development, and on the same line. They're not opposing, they're aligning themselves. And that's, that's something probably 10 years ago we weren't able to imagine. Um, great. Thank you so much, panel. Um, those are some really inspiring comments there. Um, I think it really shows how far we've come in the last 10 years. And like you said, it, not just in the technical side, but also with electricity as a business and from the economic perspective too. Um, so that gives us a reason for optimism and ambition. And Heather, as you connected it to the larger picture of climate action, I think this is especially poignant uh, as we embark on the road to COP26 this year and countries across the world are stepping up their uh, commitments. Um, and you know, as everyone on this panel actually alluded, the electricity sector is not a standalone sector. It's really unique in that uh, the solutions we deploy in this sector to implement the coal phase out won't just help reduce emissions in this sector, but through electrification can actually help us decarbonize uh, the larger economy. So without any bias, I would say uh, climate action on the electricity sector is really critical. Um, and so thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights. Uh, Julian, Heather, Rodolfo, and Claudio. It's been a real privilege to be able to question you today. Um, really appreciate the efforts you are making in your jurisdictions uh, to do the great transition. Um, I also want to thank everyone on the call today for your attention and for your excellent questions that have been coming in. Uh, please hang in there. We haven't been able to answer all your questions on this panel, uh, but we will be diving into the second panel, which will probably pick up on a few of your questions. For the second panel, I invite you to roll up your sleeves even higher as we dive deeper into the technological and policy solutions. Uh, this panel will be moderated by Johnny Gallagher from the National Grid. Um, Johnny, I'll invite you to the screen here and take over. Thanks again, uh, folks. It's great, thank you very much, Binu. Um, and thanks again to all the panelists from the first session. I found that really insightful and encouraging, um, demonstrating, I guess, the commitment to powering past coal, but also practical steps being taken to turn that commitment into a reality. And I think that's hugely important. 
Um, and I'm really pleased to be facilitating this discussion on sort of technical and regulatory changes that we need to see to drive the transition away from coal. Um, so we're going to run the session in the same way as the last one. Um, so we've got uh, several expert speakers who we're going to hear from. Um, and then we're going to have a Q&A and, as a reminder, um, questions through Slido using the hashtag PPCA for questions. Um, so we're going to turn first to uh, Frank Biersma from Tenet. Uh, so Tenet are the transmission system operator uh, in the Netherlands uh, and parts of Germany as well. Um, and Frank's going to talk a little bit about some of the planning aspects including reflections on what Tenet has learned over the last few years. So, Frank, if I can ask you to join me on the screen um, and give your remarks, please. Yes, Johnny. So, thank you very much for that, uh, that kind of introduction and the opportunity to, uh, to speak here. Um, yes, I would like to briefly mention a few things where we are in, in our countries, in the Netherlands and Germany, with uh, the energy transition, and then what, what we've learned. Um, so, Today, if I take Netherlands as an example, we're at about 25% uh, uh, contribution of wind and solar, variable sources generation, but also since now a couple of years, very clear government targets towards uh, making sure that number climbs rapidly to, to about 70% in, in 2030. And that's uh, only nine years from now, so that will be a very rapid, uh, rapid transition. Uh, in Germany, the numbers are a little bit different, but the, the same uh, trajectory uh, is there. Um, there have been uh, recent closures of some older coal-fired uh, plants driven by government policy uh, in recent years uh, and all the remaining coal-fired plants based on government policies in the Netherlands uh, will be closed by 2030 and Germany has also recently uh, adopted the policy of a, a phase-out towards uh, 2038. Um, now it's important to note that these government policies provide very clear and firm numbers let's say but the the whole earnings model and operating model of these, this existing fleet of uh, coal fire plant had been evolving and, and somehow been under, under pressure by the very rapid growth of renewable generation. One of the previous speakers also uh, alluded, alluded to this. And um, of course, the, had they, they've been designed historically for, for base load operation, but now with this very cheap variable electricity uh, generation coming in, let's say, um, yeah, their operating model has been uh, evolving. Now, it's good to note that in our countries also there's a substantial fleet of, of gas-fired uh, generation that currently plays an essential role as, a, as backup and is uh, providing uh, complementary service to the flexible uh, generation. I'd like to propose a sort of a thinking model of this transition in, in three phases. And the very first phase is uh, relatively easy where the and, and very relatively uh, that driven by the low cost wind and solar generation, simply adding those to, to the existing system um, and ensuring a timely grid connection, for instance, one of, being one of the key focus points for us as a TSO, making sure that grid, wind and solar can be integrated into the, into the grid as well as in a, a well-functioning electricity market where it becomes an inherent, inherent part. And this first phase, let's say, easily takes you up to about let's say 30% uh, of terawatt hour uh, contribution of the electricity mix on a year, yearly basis. Um, and this is the point that we are sort of approaching in, in our country now. Germany has just passed it and we're, we're sort of at it in the Netherlands or shortly we'll meet it. So that, that brings you to phase two. And phase two is where the, the total gigawatt installed capacity in renewable generation sort of approaches the, the typical gigawatt demand level. And that means from time to time, there will be hours where there's even more potential renewable generation in the system uh, than, than there is in stainless demand. And so there's potential excesses, let's say. And this is, well, we are currently working hard, let's say, to make sure the, our, I think, robust electricity market will continue to function well in those circumstances and provides the right, continues to provide the right incentives to, to all market parties uh, to, to match this variable wind and solar with their customers' uh, demand profiles. Um, and, and also make sure that all new types of complementary flexibility resources, flexible demand, uh, storage uh, resource, let's say, have yeah, easy access to that market, including the, the balance sheet markets that we operate as a, as a TSO. Uh, but it's a broader question, also relates to making sure a broad rollout of smart metering for, for all consumers. Um, and um, yeah, making sure that uh, not only the, the instantaneous 
incentives are right for uh, price signals towards consumers, towards market parties, but also that these, there's a firm framework for, for making investment decisions for investing in new flexibility resources, for instance. And it's clear, clearly also in this second phase that the, the revenue model, if you will, of, of conventional power plants evolves quickly uh, and, and we'll have a much more flexible generation uh, profile with reduced operating hours, uh, but at the same time still being very essential in ensuring security of supply, particularly for these longer periods that will also occur with very little uh, wind and solar uh, natural supply, if you want. And well, that phase we're currently in, and I think we're well on the way to, to have the, the right things in place there. Um, and thirdly, we're looking ahead at the start of the third phase, which is, let's say, where you, you go beyond 70% terawatt hour contribution of wind and solar, and where it's really also about decarbonizing the remaining conventional uh, generation in the system, and also overcoming longer and longer periods uh, without wind and solar, also without uh, CO2 emitting uh, generation sources. And yes, the third, third phase, we expect that, so be beyond 2030, um, will be a lot of work and it's important to prepare in time. It's also to look at, there are good examples of that. Huh? Countries like Denmark are, are in this third phase already and, and learning rest lessons and very important there is also clear, mentioned by some of the previous speakers, that this is where the whole integration of demand uh, and, uh, and supply, let's say, and also thinking about new types of flexible demand, think about power to heat and heat storage, for instance, as potentially very valuable elements in the in the whole system. So in summary, I think we're, we're well on the way in making this uh, transition. There's a very clear path for the phase out of, of coal in our countries. Uh, I would like to mention three success factors, let's say. These government targets that have really been firming up in recent years and become much clearer, have been, of course, a key driver for market parties making the right investments. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work in making sure the grid offers the, the functionalities, the connections, also the interconnection uh, to even out variability, but also enable access to, uh, to a whole broad pool of storage flexibility and backup generation, not only in our country, but including the whole Northwest, Northwest Europe region. Uh, and thirdly, then I mentioned before, the market design, making sure that works well as a driver for investments, also in these new flexibilities, which will have to be scaling up uh, rapidly also in the years ahead, so coming just after at the scale up of investments in renewable generation, which we already uh, see. Um, yeah, and finally, I want to mention that um, this is a lot of work, not only for us as a TSO, also our DSO partners, also the market parties, and uh, Rodolfo Martinez also mentioned this before, this re really also requires skilled labor and national government also are thinking about national investment strategy in building that labor force that we will need for the next decade and decades. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Frank. It was really interesting, the sort of thinking model that you propose around it. Um, and I thought actually the bit you described, the first bit is the easy bit. I thought for some that's actually quite terrifying. So it's good to hear you, know, you talk it through and talk about how actually getting there in, in your experience has been relatively easy. Um, so now I'm going to ask uh, Alvin Joyo to join us. Um, Alvin's from the European Network of Transmission System Operators for Electricity. Uh, he's the Adequacy Manager at NCOE and he's going to talk about forecasting over different time frames, what, how you need to think about that in a higher renewable um, system, as well as the importance of cooperation between countries as part of the energy transition. Um, so Alvin, can you come Yes, thanks, Johnny. So, yes, Albert Joyot, I'm a Decosy Manager at NSOI. So, uh, NSOI, as you mentioned, is a European network of TSOs for electricity in Europe, covering uh, 35 or 36 countries even in Europe. So, larger than the European Union itself. Uh, so, uh, my uh, activity is responsible for, for seasonal outlook, so uh, forecasting uh, uh, several uh, months ahead and also uh, resource adequacy at several uh, year, years ahead for, for this uh, European level. Uh, what, what we mean by adequacy uh, is to ensure at any time a balance between demand and supply. 
uh, in, a, in a simplified manner. So uh, we don't consider, for instance, the voltage or, or the stability. So what we have in Europe is that uh, there is a there was a, a new decided a very large regulation that you might, you have I'm quite sure uh, all mightly uh, all aware. Uh, it's uh, the European Clean Energy Package for for all uh, citizens, and in this uh, very large package to to support energy transition, uh, there is uh, one regulation, the electricity regulation which was updated and uh, entered into force with the whole package mid 2019 and inside this electricity regulation uh, there is a requirement to have an annual assessment of resource adequacy looking 10 years ahead uh, with a very ambitious uh, i would say uh, approach uh, which uh, which has been uh, built uh, through methodology. So today we have an approved methodology by approved by the European regulator ACER last year, and then we started the implementation of that. It means concretely every year we assess uh, with a uh, probabilistic. Uh, complex manner with a with numerous mathematical calculation. Uh, the, the probability of uh, of uh, lack of uh, of supply to match demand in uh, looking at a five to ten year ahead. Uh, what what I want to insist on is that every kind of capacity resource uh, is considered and can contribute. So it goes much uh, further beyond the conventional dispatchable, uh, as we already discussed in the other panels. Uh, but the assessment considered at hourly resolution, the different types of technologies like uh, storage, and for storage we can have different types, the short-term and medium-term hydro storage, the demand-side response, and of course all interconnections between the northern Europe in Norway to southern uh, down to Turkey. So the, the renewable also, and the variable renewables are considered like wind and photovoltaic, and uh, the, they're considered respecting their probability of uh, availability at hourly levels. For that, we, we have also a climate database which uh, currently builds on uh, historical years, but on the top of it, uh, we will uh, upgrade it to include the climate change and to yes to match to match with the evolution of, of the real uh, climate. So this climate database means temperature, wind, uh, and uh, irradiation, especially plus uh, other other indicators. That leads to uh, to build from this climate database. We built a demand profiles and a wind and photovoltaic uh, solar profiles. And then we have a big machinery with all this together, uh, calculated at uh, hourly uh, levels with uh, an optimization. And uh, on the top of that, we have a uh, a new a recent requirement, which is to proceed to an economic viability uh, of assets, or so quality uh, viability check of assets. That means that uh, we start on the best estimate, the assumptions given by by the different TSOs, and uh, we we will calculate a kind of likelihood of. Uh, unit uh, retirement, for instance, or like likelihood or, 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 or asset that will not be viable and then will be uh, decommissioned in the in the study. So the, the goal is to give visibility to to all uh, electricity markets, especially the member states on the TSOs, and uh, uh, to to help to to take the right decision uh, for the evolution of energy mix on adequacy. And as you can imagine, uh, 
So th this has an impact, this assessment will have an impact and possible decision for capacity mechanism in Europe. So it has, uh, I would see a policy, uh, a, a, po a potential policy impact. And it shows as well the very important uh, interdependency between member states, uh, which is uh, which is a specificity, maybe it's not only in Europe, where each member state is responsible for own security of supply and uh, can, uh, can propose some, uh, uh, some capacity mechanism, but it's all, all, and can also decide some uh, fast or, or, or slow coal phase out or nuclear phase out, but this decision impacts all the neighbors so that uh, there are uh, discussions at European level with uh, uh, all member states together through uh, electricity coordination group, which is led by uh, the European Commission. So yes, it is in a nutshell what what we what we perform here. That's great. Thank you very much for that, uh, Alban. I think it's interesting. We sort of looped back again to the capacity uh, topic. It's a really interesting area, thinking about um, the sorts of incentives, I, I guess, for um, for different types of generation. Um, so now we're going to uh, turn to uh, Jochen Kreusel, uh, who's Global Head of Market Innovation at Hitachi ABB. Um, so Hitachi ABB are a leading supplier of innovative solutions to the energy sector. And Jochen is going to talk a little bit about those technology solutions, how they can help address the challenges we see in the energy transition. Thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to be here. I would also like to start with the question that has been raised earlier, also in the first session. So if, if we would have been asked 10, 15 years ago, how will all of this work out and what are the big challenges most likely we would have heard things like well at those high shares of renewables that were the objectives of some legislations for instance the european union by 2020 we will certainly face issues with reliability of supply system the managing systems will become much more difficult it will be completely impossible without storage certainly people would have said that uh, and cost for balancing as it by the way was also mentioned in the previous panel will be very high at at the best so if we look at and and most many people 15 years ago would also have added but for sure we will not need that many grids anymore because it's all distributed decentralized and beautiful and small we don't forget it's not that long ago so if we look at what really has happened none of these forecasts have been right uh, we had any issues with reliability of supply in fact i'm living in germany which always enjoyed a very high reliability of supply but statistically it even increased during the past years uh, it's not much so it's certainly not statistically significant but definitely there was no problem uh, we still have not more storage in the system than we used to have in fact we have even less because the existing storages in the alps are not utilized anymore not properly the the swiss and austrian operators are suffering uh, control cost of purchasing frequency response services and auxiliary services are low today and we have learned that grids play a very important role transmission networks was also mentioned before and we will most likely need more of them than ever before because we will need a transnational integration much more than we used to have in the past so what can why all of this went be, uh, different and fair to say better than expected uh, well i think because people try to extrapolate extrapolate the future from their past experience and i think that's the first lesson learned we are not talking about the same system so extrapolation is maybe not the best advice the other reason is a lot of things and now coming to the question that i was asked 
a lot of things have happened on the technical side and on the operational side. So, uh, and partly things that we definitely didn't have on the radar screen. Let me begin with one very early example. In the early days, 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of talks about smart grids and most people were equaling this with smart meters, which I never liked very much. Uh, but one of the first innovations we were facing and seeing evolving from one of our pilot projects with DSO in, them, in that case was in order to integrate, accommodate highly distributed generation, we need to control voltage dynamically on distribution level, secondary distribution level, where it usually wasn't controlled, it wasn't even measured. Uh, so, and we developed solutions for that. So today you can buy various solutions to manage voltage on distribution level. Uh, another type of innovation that I like very much is because it's a mix out of market rules, market design, and technical solutions in the end. Why are control power costs relatively low today? First of all, because uh, market closing times have been reduced dramatically over the past 10 years, which means most of the imbalances are sorted out in short-term markets and not with the control power system. And the remaining part, the, the, the offering has been increased by accepting pools, by accepting smaller entities. And we heard before the Internet of Things plays a role. Well, I'm not sure whether this is already Internet of Things, but coordinating multiple these uh, high numbers of distributed assets is certainly a digital play. Uh, so digitalization helped us a lot in dealing with the volatility, dealing, uh, accessing additional resources in the market, not making the problem disappear, but giving us much more opportunities to solve it. Uh, also, in the area of transmission networks, if we see today the increasing role of power electronics, both for reactive power control, we see much more static wire compensators, that comes in the system helping us stabilizing the transmission grids and also actively influencing uh, the load flow, which means increasing the utilization of existing assets, which is certainly good for everything, for system stability, for consumer bills, and so on and so on. Uh, we have seen a tremendous development in the area of a high voltage DC technology, originally driven from offshore applications, where in combination with cables, you don't have another choice, at least not economically. But today we are talking also about HVDC overlay structures in the continental network. We are closely cooperating here with the TSOs that are that have to solve that task. Um, we also saw, by the way, uh, and it was mentioned, transmission grid is always the bottleneck because it has the longest permission times and so on. One lesson learned on the continent in Europe was that in, in cases where it's suitable, it's not the one fits all. I think that's in common for all what we are saying, but wherever it's possible, it may help to consider cables, and that is only possible in transmission in combination with DC technology. So it's a mix of technology, technology, project-based decisions. But to make the long story short, during these 10 to 15 years, a lot of solutions have evolved, driven by the need, by the new tasks. And what can we learn from all of that? So far, we can say we can be confident. We got the solutions that were required in time, and I'm very confident that we will continue to get them in time. But we also need to understand that technological innovation will help us mastering these challenges and not this being something that is risky and needs to be somehow avoided, which is an attitude we have observed in the past in very well established old proven systems it's a natural human behavior i think uh, but we have to understand technology and innovation are the keys to to help us mastering that and and we are very confident that by then, that this will help us mastering it that's great thank you very much for that jochen um, i think it's really good to hear that sort of inspiring message about the ability of technology innovation to meet some of these challenges and your confidence in that. Um, so final um, panelist on this uh, is Daniel Yuriyu, uh, who's Vice President of Government Relations um, at Capital Power. 
Um, particularly pleased to have Daniel, because I know it's incredibly early in the morning. I think it was half five uh, when he first joined the call this morning, his time. So um, Daniel's going to touch uh, just quickly on market signals um, that encourage renewables. Um, so Daniel, over to you. Good morning, and it's, uh, thank you for the invitation and opportunity to participate. And it's now light outside. Uh, uh, where did you observe earlier? Um, so, uh, just to, by way of brief background, I will speak to uh, you know some more of the regulatory solutions uh, as part of the uh, you know coal uh, coal transition, and I'll speak from our experience as a uh, wholesale power generator and our uh, particularly in Alberta. But uh, by way of brief background, Capital Power is a wholesale power generator based out of Edmonton, Alberta. We currently operate 28 facilities, uh, representing over 6,400 megawatts across Canada and the U.S. Uh, and our, our fleet is currently comprised of uh, 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 coal at our existing Genesee units, which I'll uh, come to shortly, but also uh, re uh, renewables and uh, natural gas facilities. Um, uh, and on a portfolio basis, uh, coal dual fuel on, uh, is about 22% of our fleet. Uh, natural gas facilities are about 57%, and wind and solar are the balance. And we currently have uh, seven renewable facilities under development uh, across North America. And that will add uh, uh, 425 megawatts by the end of 2022. But for the purposes of this discussion, I do want to focus on our Genesee units, uh, which are located just west of Edmonton. Uh, those are three units that currently represent over uh, or nearly 1,400 megawatts. Uh, two of them are subcritical units. Uh, and one is uh, Genesee 3 is super critical. Uh, they're relatively new. Uh, the oldest one was built in 1989, uh, the newest one uh, in 2005. And they were built uh, within Alberta's uh, uh, competitive wholesale market, which is an energy only market design that's been in place uh, since 2001. Uh, uh, and uh, so, that, that, so that's the first pillar uh, uh, in terms of kind of uh, the framework uh, that's uh, uh, important to the transition. Uh, uh, so so uh, within that market, that's continually provided a signal for efficiency and cost effectiveness in operation. So, you know, we have always, uh, you know, uh, maintained a strong commitment to uh, upgrading efficiency of those units uh, and remaining competitive in Alberta's uh, merit order. Uh, the second element uh, that, that's uh, relevant, Alberta since 2007 has had a carbon pricing framework uh, for large emitters. And uh, the, the first generation of that uh, uh, carbon pricing framework uh, established a compliance obligation on a facility-specific base, uh, basis uh, that uh, resulted in a carbon cost of roughly you know, $3 a megawatt hour for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, an average coal unit. So that became part of the cost that we managed and uh, you know, affected our competitiveness in, in the stack. So um, what happened in the mid uh, uh, around the 2015 timeframe, there were a series of policy actions taken and uh, initiated that uh, increased the stringency of the carbon pricing framework, uh, where the, the average carbon cost went from about $3 a megawatt hour to about $18 a megawatt hour. And that resulted from the change in the basis to uh, being off the best, you know, rather than facility specific, the uh, compliance obligation for all uh, units were assessed relative to the intensity of a, the best uh, natural gas unit. So that uh, had a significant uh, magnifying effect on you know, efficiency and, and, and the cost of you know, coal facilities relative to others in the fleet. And then the third uh, piece was uh, in 2015, the government of the day announced uh, the coal phase out policy uh, where you know, coal units will, uh, would uh, no longer be allowed to operate on coal post 2030. Uh, and uh, each, that affected the, uh, that curtailed on average the coal operating lives of the three generating uh, Genesee units by about 57 percent. So uh, the, the government uh, did uh, enter into a process, uh, work with ourselves and the two other uh, companies that, that were similarly impacted, and did come up with uh, uh, a, a reasonable uh, compensation framework. Uh, that recognized the stranded capital uh, of the assets, you know, uh, relating to the you know, truncated operating lives. So the, the combined effect of those three measures really, you know, uh, uh, magnified or accelerated our own focus to 
uh, and put us on a path to you know, tr you know, transition the Genesee units uh, through three measures. The first one was we undertook a program to increase the efficiency of the units by 12% uh, uh, by the end of this year. And as part of that, uh, that would bring the uh, performance of some of the subcritical, the subcritical units to the uh, basically supercritical uh, coal efficiency. Uh, the second was to uh, uh, take steps to increase the, uh, the flexibility of all three units to utilize natural gas uh, up to 100%, and that would benefit from the efficiency programs. And uh, that was uh, uh, the plan was to uh, operate those units on full flexibility until uh, 2030. But uh, in part, uh, you know, given uh, commodity forecasts, uh, we uh, recently announced a, a full repowering of the Genesee one and two units, where uh, we will uh, repower those uh, and uh, install state-of-the-art combined cycle. Uh, units at the facilities that will uh, be the most efficient in Canada and that will have uh, be built with some hydrogen capability and carbon capture uh, re readiness. So this you know, marks the end of the or a new the start of a new stage of uh, the, the Genesee uh, facility and it's uh, a, a product of what, what we believe is well designed you know, electricity markets, you know, effective carbon pricing and an appropriate and, and reasonable, you know, you know, coal phase-out arrangement uh, that uh, we, we worked with the, the government on. And, and just the last point, uh, those same signals in terms of uh, enabling our transition of the Genesee units has also created opportunities uh, on the renewable space. Uh, in Alberta, uh, as under the, the you know the combined effect of the market design and the you know, offset uh, credits enabled through the carbon pricing, has provided a strong signal for us and others to uh, you know uh, further grow uh, renewables in Alberta. And you have seen you know uh, you know the uh, the commercial procurement market really take off, uh, and uh, 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 four or five of the facilities. You know, four of the facilities on uh, renewable projects we have underway are in Alberta. So, you know, within a, what we believe is a very effective, you know, electricity market and carbon policy framework in Alberta, we are, you know, uh, you know transforming our strategy. And uh, maybe I'll stop uh, my comments there. That's great. It's really interesting to hear that perspective of um, an, an investor in coal assets and how. You know, market changes can help get away from that. Um, so we're going to turn to some questions now and just to remind uh, the audience that you can submit those via Slido. Um, and we've got a few coming through already. Um, but I'm going to start with um, just a question I wanted to ask. Um, so just thinking, what is the role of system operators in making it easier for investors to uh, develop low carbon generation options. And I wondered, um, you know, Frank obviously representing a transmission system operator and Daniel um, as an investor, uh, if you could comment on that. So turning first to Frank and then Daniel. Yeah. So I think the, the first part is making sure that uh, the, the mechanisms we have in place for balancing the system, uh, also at times managing congestion in the system, that they are fully accessible to, yeah, to a broad variety, to, to, to uh, non-discriminatory access for all types of technologies and in particular that means making sure they're very suitable also for distributed and new types of flexibility and, and resources. Second thing I, I yeah, want to propose is um, we, we've been we're carefully looking at uh, grid impacts for instance beyond just balancing load but also power quality uh, in case or in, if at this future time uh, a specific coal fire plants at certain places stop operating. Uh, and making sure that that we procure the necessary uh, uh, yeah, reactive power types of things uh, from other plants and also from uh, yeah even at times from uh, 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 yeah battery or let's say power electronics driven uh, driven technologies I think those are the main things we've been um, we've been looking at Uh, so, so from our perspective, I, I think there's kind of two main roles that the uh, the system operator has played in Alberta. Uh, you know, the, the first is uh, just maintaining the transmission system, and uh, within Alberta's market, uh, the, the transmission framework contemplates a you know a relatively congestion-free system. So, I think that's the you know enabling access at, uh, to renewable projects as they come online, 
and uh, evolving the system to ensure that it continues to operate, you know, congestion free for, for the, uh, the rest of the fleet so the overall market works effectively. Uh, and a second area that's an ongoing uh, focus of uh, discussions uh, by the Alberta ISO is just with respect to the market rules themselves and whether it's on the ancillary services side or you know, just the dispatch side, you know, just to manage, you know, you know, the, the, just the changing uh, nature of dispatch of the fleet and just to make sure, you know, over the long term, you know, the overall price signal is providing an opportunity for, you know, the various uh, generating types to have an opportunity to earn a return but is sending that the right signal for you know retirement and, and new market entry. And Johnny, if I, if I may, I would add one more one more thought to that. Uh, Daniel, you actually triggered me. Uh, this was uh, I think this this interaction between parties is very important uh, about this. And firstly, during the process where the the Dutch government and German governments are setting these targets, let's say, there's been actually a very productive interaction between market parties, grid operators, TSO, to to make sure the plan is feasible. And doable. Um, and secondly, is that we've been quite active in engaging with knowledge institutes, but also the demand side industries, is that and actually getting the knowledge development and thinking uh, going in the country on how also the demand side can evolve and, and develop uh, as, as becoming this more active part of the, the future system. Great, thank you very much. Um, Maybe I can um, also add something. Yeah, I'll get Yeah, well, it also came to my mind. I think investors are usually also interested in a certain certainty and and re remembering the the three phases that Frank has described and which I would like fully support. If we are thinking about countries that are just entering this journey, not the advanced ones, which are entering phase one, where it's all technically still simple. One lesson learned that we have seen looking at many countries in the world being a global player is that you cannot too early start to think about grid codes also considering phase two and three even, but at least two, because if people, are, investors are prepared from the very beginning on what they have to deliver later on, well, this gives certainty. So early commitment on network codes, on the, the rules of the game, how to connect to the grid and the services that you, Assets connected to the grid have to provide to the grid in order to keep the system stable is very important because otherwise it will result in costly corrections afterwards whenever you enter phase two and that's not fun for anyone, not for investors, not for consumers who have to pay the bill, not for system operators and so on and so on. That's really, uh, really helpful. I'm just actually going to press on that point a little bit about lessons learned from, um, you know, previous experience. We've had a question on Slido um, asking what lessons can be learned for investments in renewables uh, and applied to investments in storage. Um, so I wonder, actually, Jochen, if I can just flip that straight back to you, um, because I think it's sort of it's an interesting way of thinking. Oops, I have to from investments in. Well, I would. There is one lesson. I'm not sure whether it's it is closely linked to what we had before, and I'm not that sure whether the investors in the assets can alone can handle it. But the entire community can one lesson learned that we have clearly seen in particular with very decentralized entities is that in the beginning they seem to be very small and not really relevant to the system but what had been forgotten or overseen is that we are, when we're talking about decentralized solutions we are talking about large quantities otherwise it doesn't make sense and and altogether they can become very relevant for the system and that goes back to and that has to be coordinated by network codes by rules of the game and again it's providing certainty to investors this is not specific for renewables versus storage i have to admit and um, i'm still searching the point that i could transfer there particularly but the, the the character of being decentralized is common to many of these solutions and earlier in this conversation batteries have been already mentioned being a type of storage that is feasible today for short-term applications and batteries and particular solar PV have in common that they are very scalable technologies. So by nature, they can become very decentralized. And there it's really important that you have a 
a, a framework which is with a cert with some certainty be, can be stable. And here I come back to the network codes issue and, and learn from, from other countries what, how, what they have experienced. Frank, I see you would like to say something on this. Yeah, if I could chip in one uh, thought, because actually at, at some point in my past, I've worked in uh, renewable projects mm -hmm. and so I've, I've experienced those dynamics. And really important element of the, the cost reduction curve mm -hmm. uh, in renewables has also been the cost of financing. Mm -hmm. And very important process has been in there is for financing parties, first of all, in the projects to, to have a, a level of best practices established of mm -hmm. how to contact these things reliably, how to manage risks. So actually have that rollout uh, build on a lot of experience. And secondly, have that be the basis of financiers becoming uh, very comfortable with these kind of investments, uh, being a key part in enabling this rapid scaling up. And I think an important focus part for us is also making sure that those same kind of learning curves can uh, can happen quickly on the part, the part of uh, new technologies that the storage, but certainly also mm flexible demand, which is new types of business cases. That's really helpful. Thank you for that, Frank. Um, so I want to just also, again, focus on um, you know, what we can learn. Um, and one question I'm going to direct to Alvin first. Um, so see, NCOE does a lot of work with the European uh, Commission. And just thinking about what the role of those sort of policy making entities is um, in really driving the transition away from coal um, and maybe also, um, again, if we could come back to Daniel on that, would be great. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Johnny. The, the role of policy making uh, for, for, for leaving the, the, the coal, uh, uh, it's, it's something that is exactly a coordination between the member states who, that uh, would decide at, uh, at the national level and also the, the European uh, Union, especially on, on Europe, Europe at a larger scope. Uh, so today it is true that we, we are in the starting phase of that. And uh, the, the, the carbon prices, for instance, are, are some, some possibility to trigger a further uh, coal phase out in some countries. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, there, there is uh, uh, there is importance to have this coordination between the member states uh, to 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 be able to to have a coordinated uh, uh, a coordinated uh, phase out when possible, as each decision will impact the neighbour. What, what what decision it can be. And our role as NSU is not is not to is not to to enter into any de decision, political decision, but just to to monitor and to to show what what is the situation if we go that trajectory. So, uh, fr from our perspective, I think uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, roles of the policy policymakers. It's uh, you know certainly to provide you know, you know articulate clear policy objectives. But I think in the context of the coal phase out and Alberta's uh, experience, the <clears throat> addressing investor confidence and investor certainty for you know those uh, you know entities most impacted uh, is is an important element of it. And I, I touched on it in my opening remarks. But I, I think when you know, uh, it was first announced as part of the, the plan in 2015 that their, you know, coal units would uh, no longer be allowed to operate by 2030. There was a commitment right at the outset, you know, that there would be a process to, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, provide compensation to or avoid, uh, you know, stranded investments uh, because that, that was a very important signal at the outset because, you know, from the broader, you know, uh, financial community, it's not just, you know, the what happens to you know the affected company, but you know, uh, you know measures that might be viewed as unreasonable, um, you know th those affect the broader uh, perception of the market, not just in the electricity sector but economy wide. So that's uh, I think it's you know as and the circumstances of every uh, jurisdiction, you know, looking at th these types of measures will be uh, you know, different, no doubt. And you know, I uh, heard reference earlier to the panel tomorrow looking at financial measures, but 
I think the way Alberta handled that particular part of it, like from the outset, you know, providing a commitment that there would be a solution to it, and then, you know, the process that was undertaken and where it ended up, that was critical uh, in addressing, you know, uh, an investor, you know, confidence issue that we, we believe went beyond just the three companies impacted. So, so I think uh, maybe that's an important element as, you know, uh, regions consider this going forward. Maybe I can also add one aspect which we came across during the past years. I'm also uh, active in European policies, you may say. I'm the deputy president of TD Europe, which is the trade association representing the technology providers. So we are in regular contact with both NCE and the Commission. And one thing we came across is we are talking about technically evolving, changing, you may even say reinventing an integrated technical system. We should never forget the entire electricity system, generators, network, even consumers is one technical system that somehow needs to be operated, but it is owned by millions of economic individual entities. And this needs to be coordinated and we need to develop a joint, a common vision what we expect from this system. And Frank had mentioned already, it's very important to have this stakeholder dialogue involve all the affected stakeholders and agree what, how we expect this to operate and what functionalities we also want the infrastructure to provide in future. In the previous session, the Internet of Things have been mentioned. The Internet of Things requires a digital connectivity, which I guess, because we're all interested in reliable supply, has to be super secure. So it's not the normal Internet. And this doesn't come by itself. It has to be defined and rolled out. And we have to agree what functionalities we expect from it. And you may argue, well, this is what we expect from smart meters, but don't forget the name. When people were talking about smart meters, they talked about metering. They did not about managing an internet of things. It may happen by accident, but it shouldn't happen by accident. We should decide that and roll out it in, in a coordinated way. And this is a role which hasn't been foreseen in the traditional regulatory thought model we have applied. The, the thought model of the unbundled market with regulated networks and competitive uh, players of the energy market is that we know how this system has to be built and operated. It's an existing system that should be operated efficiently. But now we are talking about reinventing a system and of course at the same time operating it efficiently. So it's just an element that wasn't part of the old and partly still present regulatory framework and needs to be added. We need to develop a joint vision, a stakeholder. No, it's not a dialogue. It's a, it's a conversation among several stakeholder groups around the networks and agree what has to be rolled out by when. Great, thank you very much. I think we have probably time for one final question um, before we bring Binu back in and wrap up. Um, and can take it from Slido. Uh, so it's a question about um, countries that have been leaders in renewables um, but are still, despite that, heavy users of coal um, and what could have been done differently in those jurisdictions to reduce coal specifically uh, over the last 10 years. Um, so I wonder um, maybe Frank, you talked earlier about coal phase out dates. I guess the question is really, you know, what could have been done to make those more ambitious? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting uh, question, I think. So first of all, it's, uh, had, you see evolving thinking over the decades of what the energy transition actually entails. And first thinking is just in this first phase, just add wind and solar and, and really only when you get way into that, then you, these next questions pop up. And you could argue that full system design should have been thought through earlier. And that would then have also allowed longer term uh, policy clarity, for instance. However, we are in a very dynamic environment where technology cost of renewable changes, the cost of storage changes, all these things. So, so it's natural, let's say, that we are thinking also evolves uh, over time. I do think it's very interesting that, well, of course, there's been the government realization in our countries that, well, coal phase out will not happen just by itself. But it is also clear that the, the, the earnings model of the coal fleet, let's say, has been uh, 
impacted firstly by these renewables rapidly coming into the system uh, and secondly by uh, this European ETS uh, and, and CO2 pricing mechanism which for a number of years has been slumbering at very low levels but has but the trajectory of price having to increase mm -hmm. because of the sort of the overall CO2 emission cap towards 20, 30 and 50 was clear. Um, yeah, that, that is now kicking in basically, starting to become really felt uh, and again affecting these uh, these coal-fired power plants. So it's, it's from multiple fronts, let's say, where uh, the future of these plants are <clears throat> have, have changed, let's say, the future yeah. outlook. That's great. Thank you very much. And I think um, just looking at the time, i uh, probably wrap it up there. But thank you very much to all the panellists for your contributions. I thought that was a really interesting session um, and lots to think about. Um, so Binu is going to come back in and just wrap up the overall session. Thank you, Johnny. And um, thank you to all the panelists again um, for your insights on the second session. Definitely got to geek out a bit more, so I really appreciate that. And particularly hearing the insights, you know, both uh, from a utility perspective as well as uh, from the grid perspective. Um, I don't have too much more to add, but just saying, you know, we've had a really productive conversation, had some fantastic questions come in, and wanted to offer that we do want to host more of these conversations. National Grid is also very keen to do so, um, looking to host conversations that share similar best practices, but also in particular leading up to COP26, uh, looking at how we can raise our collective ambition, not just in the jurisdictions we operate in, but also ambition for regulators, utilities, and grid operators, and what our role can be uh, in this space. So if you are interested in uh, participating in more of these conversations, please send an email to the PPCA Secretariat, and we'll follow up with you and keep you in the loop on further developments. Um, uh, but that's all I had to say. Um, thank you again, uh, panelists, for sharing your insights and for all the audience participation and excellent questions throughout this. Johnny, thanks again for moderating this technical discussion as well. It was fantastic to partner with you on this session. All right. Um, take care, everyone, and have a good rest of the summit. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye.